Hey guys, what's going on? So today we're gonna to be doing an episode that I've wanted to do for quite a long time. I'm actually gonna be reviewing my new car. So I decided to do it now because I just hit 3,000 miles on it, so I wanted to give it a little run, try to find out everything that I liked about the car that I didn't necessarily like about the car and bring it all to you first person. So let's take a look at this car and go over the whole thing. Stay tuned, I really think you're gonna like this one. All right, so as some of you guys can see and can tell by the graphics and the, the title up or below, I can't remember where it's put, but anyway, this is the 5.7 liter Daytona Edition Charger. Now, basically they've done a lot to the vehicle um, opposed to the normal RT. So we're gonna go through some of those things as well as some of the other things that really drew me towards this one. There's a couple different characteristics um, that chose me or that led me to choose this particular one, let alone the Daytona itself. All right, so there's a few things that actually led me to the 5.7 liter Daytona. Now, as you can tell, the fascia and everything on the car is a little bit different from the regular RT, so let's go through those uh, slight differences before we move on to why I chose this one. So, as you can see by the fascia, you do actually have the SRT style bumper on here, as well as a functional hood scoop. Now, the Daytona also comes equipped with a functional cold air intake. That's kind of cool, the RT doesn't actually have that. Um, as well as some other interior packages, the, the wheels themselves are upgraded. You do have the uh, 20 by nine, uh, they're called the hyper black rims, um, but they're the dark metal gray, so I don't quite understand the naming on that. But anyway, I also did my, something on mine to have it stand out, obviously you can tell. Uh, I got a little bear claw going on on the front, so uh, that's just something I like to have my vehicle stand out from everybody else's, and that's just something very, very simple that you can do to have it stand out. Not everybody likes it. Don't worry. If you don't like it, I understand. Not 100% on it, but I think I like it, so I've, I've kept it. But anyway, you get the vinyl decal on the hood here. Um, says Hemi across it. Thinking about actually changing it out for maybe some racing stripes going down it. But also on the Daytona, you get the matte black roof, as well as the matte black spoiler, and the Daytona decals on the sides. Now they've actually done a great job in isolating the inside of the cabin with dual pane glass on each side. It's really cool. Let me show you that real quick. All right, so as you can kind of see here, you do have the dual pane style glass. So you have glass, an acrylic piece, I believe, on the inside to kind of separate the other pane of glass. So basically what that does is it's going to limit the amount of sound that actually gets into the cabin. It's really cool and it's a great design. It's actually something that they brought over from the Grand Cherokees. So anyway, as you can see, here's the inside of the engine bay on a 5.7. However, there's something a little bit different. There's actually a couple of things different. So as I said before, this does come with a functional cold air intake with the scoop, functional scoop with the cold air intake. One of the things that I changed, and you might notice right away if you kind of know about the 5.7s, is there's no longer a big, huge plastic piece covering this entire engine bay. And I actually changed that out for a reason. I really, really like these half covers that you can actually get for the 5.7. It kind of opens up your engine bay see the engine itself i think it looks a lot nicer and it makes it look a lot meaner um, that's one of the reasons why i did it and i actually installed this right here this is actually really really hot so i'm actually not going to touch it but that is actually an oil catch can so with these engines they're producing a lot of power and when you get on the throttle sometimes the oil doesn't actually get all the way burned up so what happens is there usually is a feeder hose from here to here and it distributes the oil and the unused air back into the engine so it can be burned up on the next cycle. But you really don't want pre-burned oil to go all the way through the cycle again, gum up all the works from this point on. It could really do some damage to your engine long term. So 
I've done a lot of research on it. Um, these weren't cheap, so I ended up picking up one. I don't have the fancy one with the fancy piping yet. Uh, I might get the little sleeves that you can put on it to make it look a lot nicer. But anyway, this is mostly closed unless I'm at a car show and then I open it up sometimes and you can see how clean it is and all that fun stuff. So anyway, I got the oil catch can. I do highly, highly recommend it um, as a thing to really help with the longevity of the vehicle because Basically, you're not gonna have that gumming up the entire thing. All right, so just to show you uh, how crucial this really is, it's not necessarily crucial, but it's, I think, kind of important. Um, obviously, it's kind of hot, so I'm gonna use these two, uh, oops, ready, tighty, lefty, loosey. Let's not tighten it anymore if we don't need to. Uh, but let's see how much oil is actually trapped in the bottom of this catch can. All right, so obviously I can't get it very good, but you can kind of see the oil down in there. That's actually only about 400 or so miles driving on the car. And now that very thick burn up oil is going to be coursing back through your system and back into the engine to be burned again. Not good. All right, so now let's go over some of the things on the interior of the car that separates it from the RT. So first thing you're gonna recognize is the seating differences. Now, this comes with the same seating capacity. However, this has the leather trimmed outside with these suede inserts. Now, these are awesome. These do not get insanely hot in the summer. I can tell you for sure because right now it's about 85 degrees-ish. Sun's been beating down on the car all day long. If this entire inside was leather, I'd feel it getting into the car and trust me, it's not. It's really, really soft, real plush, and it actually has heating and cooling elements in it. So you get heated seats in the, in the winter, cooled seats in the summer. One of the other things that you get on these is a standard leather wrapped steering wheel with a heating element inside it as well. So sticking with the steering wheel real quick is you do also get the paddle shifters, which are standard on the Daytona edition. If you were to have the RT, you actually have to step up into the Super Track Pack edition. That also does come with the styling changes that you saw on the front of the car on the Daytona. You just don't get the decals on the roof, on the hood, and on the tail end of the car itself. One of the other things that you get on the inside of these cars, which I absolutely love, is the 8.4 inch display. This thing is like a tablet. It's huge. You can see everything clearly, no matter where you're sitting at in the car. It's one of the things I absolutely, absolutely love about this vehicle. Now this one actually does come equipped with the 8.4 inch, I think it's uh, Uconnect C with Navi. So this one does have the integrated nav. However, you do have the 8.4 inch display. Um, you can actually hook it up and you can use Android Auto or Apple CarPlay. Now I love those, just started using them and it's, I don't even use the regular navigation. Literally I just hook up my phone and use Google Maps because basically I can hold down the voice recognition button and it'll actually bring up my Google Assistant to be able to assist me in either checking on something or setting, uh, sending some text messages out via voice. Whereas you can't do that through the automated system. On the other thing, you actually have to use the Google Assistant to have it basically translate from uh, voice to text, which is really cool. So some of the other things that you get with that, um, you get the home link system. So basically you can program up to three garage doors in there, um, as well as an assist and an SOS button. Now the navigation system that comes in these actually comes with Sirius Guardian. Now, if you don't know what Sirius Guardian is, it's kind of like an app for your phone to control your car while you're not there. That's uh, kind of a mouthful and, and whatnot. But basically what it does is you have your app on your phone. You can lock, unlock, start the car, or start your panic alarm for your car, no matter where it is in the US and no matter where you are in the US. Basically, if there is a satellite or a cell phone signal to your car, you can actually have that run. Basically, it travels through, I believe, 4G on the Sirius Guardian ones, whereas the older generation, which was the Uconnect access system, ran off of 3G. So whatever um, you have 3G, it's available for the Uconnect access, which this one does not have. It has the upgraded Sirius Guardian, which I believe is the 4G system. I could be wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. Let me know in the comment section down below. That's, I believe, one of the things that I trained on uh, before I bought this car. But 
let's take a look at the back. See what you get in the back that you wouldn't get in the RT unless you go to the RT Plus. Let's take a look at that. Okay, so as you can see, you have a few buttons down here as well as two, kind of one, two USB ports for the rear seats. Now the buttons up there, I don't know if you can see it, you might be able to point it out a little bit. Those are actually heated seats for the rear. So this seat and the seat that I'm sitting in currently are actually heated, which is fantastic. But take a look at this. So here is where I would be sitting. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry for the glare. You can kind of see it. I'm, I'm parked really badly right now. But here is the amount of leg room right there if I were to be sitting in that front seat. So here's this seat. You get all that leg room for the rear passengers. So now I talk about leg room, which uh, you really you're not gonna be necessarily buying this car because of the leg room, but it is one of the things that actually pulled me towards this one opposed to the Challenger. So I wanted, just in case I had friends or whatnot, uh, actually in the car riding along with me, I know I go on vacations to Canada and we drive up there, so we were gonna be taking this car. So I like a lot of room in the back seats. One of the things that I absolutely, absolutely love, and one of the other reasons why I actually chose this over the Challenger, is insurance companies actually classify this car with a big V8 as a family sedan. I'll let that sink in. Family sedan. What that means is I used to have a Toyota Avalon. Now for that Avalon, I only paid $1.67 more per month for insurance. Avalon, six cylinder, luxury-ish car. V8, bad, muscle car. Family sedan. Let that sink in. So going back to the whole Avalon story, between the Avalon and this, this car is actually a little bit longer, has a little bit more leg room than my Toyota Avalon did. And all that is actually one of the vehicles that I thought is one of the bigger ones in this class. I, this isn't technically in this class, so I didn't really know when I was doing research when I was with Toyota, everything that was similar or different than this car. This car is actually an inch and a half longer than that car. I bought this car thinking that, oh yes, I have a one car garage, I'll be able to finally, finally be able to put some stuff on the back wall so I don't have everything crammed on the sides of my garage. Boy, boy was I mistaken on that front. Now, with that being said, this vehicle is 198 inches long. So depending on how long your garage is, that's mostly going to fit in just about anything you can throw at it. Um, unless you have a super short garage, then it may not because obvious reasons it may not be long enough, but basically this is gonna fit into most garages, uh, so you're not gonna have to worry about that. You just get a lot of space and a lot of trunk room too. All right, so you're gonna have to bear with me. The floor's kind of dirty, but anyway, I wanted to show you one thing. So these are actually the bright pedals. These actually come also standard. Now, it's not a huge thing, but I kind of like the look of them. It ties everything in together. So you've got that. Um, you have some styling changes too. So I'm gonna come way back out here. Here's that 8.4 inch nav screen that I was talking about earlier. And man, I can't find a place where the sun isn't right there. So that 8.4 inch nav screen, actually let's start it up and let's show you this nav screen. So this screen is huge. Oh, I turned it off because I had the radio on. <laughs> so anyway, this, oh, 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 oh. Sorry, me freaking out real quick because I forgot about something entirely. This car, if it's over 80 degrees, so it's 86 right now, it's over 80 degrees, it actually turns on your cooling seats for you right when you start up the car if you wanted to. That is awesome. And I can't remember what it is. I believe it's 40 degrees and it'll actually turn on your heated steering wheel as well as your heated seats. So as you can see right here, uh, the Daytonas actually come with the push button start. You get the emblem right there as well as the seat emblem here. So the Daytonas do come standard with this Alpine sound system, which does sound great while you're driving and when you're just cruising around town, even with the windows open. All right, so in the three months of owning this car, I've really found out a number of things that I absolutely love about it and a couple things that I haven't been too, too keen on. So basically I wanted to give you a rating out of 10 after owning it for three months and after driving a lot of cars 
um, about where you would expect to stand if you were to purchase the 5.7 liter Daytona Edition charger. So, a couple things I love. I love the power for the price. I mean, the fact that you can lease one of these vehicles for in the 400s and have a styling of a car this nice and have the type of performance that you get with the ability to still pack four people in the car, five people if necessary, and be really, really comfortable, you don't really get that for the price point anywhere else. Now, with that being said, I'm going over to my next one, which is the weight of the car. Now, a lot of people actually diss the weight of the car. Obviously, it's a very, very heavy car, but there's a reason for it. It is the only one in its class to be as long as it is and have as much cargo capacity on the inside of the car. This is a practical car. It's one of the reasons why it's named a family sedan. It's a very, very practical car that you can comfortably, like I said, sit four or five people in the car and take a long trip and have nobody complain. Now, if you were to buy a Camaro, those are awesome looking cars, extremely agile and very fast in a straight line as well. But try to pack four people in there and go on a 350 mile road trip, you are gonna have some not so happy people in the back seats. Guarantee you that. And I mean the exhaust on this car. Ah, you, you know. I mean, here's a couple more clips of how awesome this exhaust is. All right, so obviously that's point number two why I love this car. So from the 2016s to the 2017s, they've actually updated the exhaust systems in these cars. So they've actually added at no extra cost, basically the SRT exhaust system. It has the active exhaust, valves open up and close um, to give you a quieter ride if you want it or a more aggressive ride if you're stepping on it. So basically you hear all the noises, you get all the experience that comes with having a big bad V8, unlike the 2015 and 2016 models. You'd buy an RT, you'd step on it, you'd feel everything, but you wouldn't hear anything. This car feels so, so much faster just because of the sound alone. All right, going into the next part that I really wish they would have done is add a four cylinder cut off an active exhaust cut off. What I mean by that is have it so that you can push a button, kind of like with the Grand Cherokees, the auto on off button. I wish you could have a button that you can push so that it makes it so that it does not go into four cylinder mode and the valves always stay open. Just for, you know, it just kicked into four cylinder mode for me. I can actually hear it because there's a little bit more drone in the cabin when it actually switches over into the four cylinder mode and the exhaust kind of closes up a little bit, which is fine. You get a lot better fuel economy, but I didn't really buy this car for the fuel economy. I bought it for the smiles per gallon is what we like to say. It's not miles per gallon, it's miles per gallon. And trust me, I get a lot of them in this car, but I just wish there was a way that you can set it without actually having to turn on the sport mode, turning it into the manual transmission mode for the everyday drivers that don't like the manual transmission mode. Now, going back to that comment of, I wish that it did, it would make no difference to me. I just wish for other people it would have it because I always drive this in sport mode, always drive it in manual transmission mode. It's just the way I enjoy driving my car. So 
based upon that, you might get some mixed feelings about what I'm saying, but I definitely wish there was an option in there just to let you do it if you wanted to. All right, so that brings me to point number two of things that I'm not so keen on for this car, I guess. I, I kind of made the weight of the car a good and a bad thing, so I'm not gonna really count that as a bad. It's kind of a good thing too, but um, anyway, what makes this not so great in terms of when you're driving is the alerts that pop up for the weather system if you have the guardian system so what the guardian system will actually do is it'll actually alert you uh, through their traffic alerts and their uh, weather alerts i haven't gotten any traffic ones yet but the really really annoying ones that i've read on a bunch of the uh, forums and on the other Charger groups that I'm on and Challenger groups I'm on is the pop-ups for the weather alerts. I get them here for places that are about 50 miles away, have nothing to do with my area at all, and they pop up all the time and they're very, very annoying. Now they've cut back recently. They were a lot more so when I first got my car, so I think they're starting to tone down on it a little bit, but they're still going to come up. So because they still come up, it's gonna bring me to my next notion. You should be able to actually go into the system and shut them off. You should be able to shut them off so that you don't have to worry about it when you're driving because now everything's open. You've got it all in front of your screen. It takes up the entire screen and you can't see what you were doing. So if you were on the navigation screen, you actually have to physically go over, hit the X on it every time that it pops up. Now they say, you know, it's a safety thing. You can't shut it off because, you know, they want to provide you with some information about the roads that you're going to be driving into, which I completely understand. If you have the GPS routed, it should alert you maybe weather stuff, or if it's for the immediate area, the weather stuff, what's going on, if you have an issue, if there's a thunderstorm warning, or if there's a flooding warning, you should know about it before you actually drive into those areas. I understand that. But somebody that doesn't go you know, on a 50 mile hike every single day and gets alerts for something that's about 50 or 60 miles away, doesn't make sense. And then actually I have to go and hit the X button, take my eyes off the road, hit the X button, just to clear the alert on the, on the system. Doesn't make sense. Should be able to turn it off. That's just my opinion on it. So would I recommend buying this car? Absolutely buy this car, this is awesome if you want an everyday driver that you can basically do anything in and still be happy this is the car now if you're somebody that is quite a muscle head they actually have a 392 version for this car i'm sure you already know that but they have a 392 6.4 liter v8 485 horsepower option 485 horsepower option that is some crazy power and that is a video to come the 5.7 versus the 6.4 what's better for the money so if you're looking to get that 485 horsepower don't buy this car and try to upgrade it you're going to spend as much if not more actually upgrading the car to get that much power just get the 6.4 to begin with trust me but if you're working on more of a budget you love the styling of the car you want a big v8 and you want the roar of that V8, buy this one. Trust me, it's worth it. Thank you guys for watching, I appreciate your time. If you happen to like the video, do me a favor, hit the like button for me. If you wanna see more like this, make sure you hit the subscribe button because I'm actually gonna be doing a video comparing the 5.7 Daytona to the 392 Daytona. That's gonna be a fun one to compare, so stay tuned for that one. Hit the subscribe button, that way you're notified when that one comes out. Now, if you have a friend or somebody that you think might actually like this, there's a share button down below. You can share it by either social media, uh, email, or what have you, whatever you wanna share it on, uh, you can do that down there as well. But if you have any questions, if you have any comments on any of the footage today, make sure, make sure you share that down with me in the comment section, that way I can get back to every one of you and uh, have a little chat. So thank you very much for watching. I appreciate your time. You guys have a great day.